co-lead our digital media practice <clears throat> where digital marketplaces are very much a focus. Um, and I'm really happy to have a fantastic panel here of, of founders and investors. Um, I'll just go down the line and do a quick introduction and then you know how fast these conversations go, so we'll dive right into it. Um, David Kalt of, 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 of Reverb is right beside me. Um, an online uh, instrument marketplace and large, very large community. Andy Nielsen, uh, founder of EBTH, an online um, estate marketplace. And then the investors over here, we have Dana Settle from Graycroft. She is an investor in a number of marketplaces like The Real Real. Um, and also EBTH. <laughs> and then Peter Guerin of, uh, of Great Hill Partners, a very active private equity group based out of Boston. He's in Click Studios and a number of other marketplaces. So that's, that's, that's the panel, and maybe we'll just kick it off. Um, so one of the questions I'm gonna pose to the founders, I think one of the really interesting things that has happened is the evolution of really digital marketplaces. You think about eBay, you think about Craigslist, things of that nature. And then you think about what your companies are doing. So your companies really probably couldn't have been as, um, as successful as they are 10 years ago or maybe even five years ago. So I'll start with, with David. Maybe the question is, what do you think that has happened? What is really the perfect storm that has enabled your company to be growing and successful as it is right now? Yeah, you know, I, um, I heard a phrase the other day um, from a, a marketplace called um, the dismantling of eBay. And I, th I think what eBay um, did really well was they figured out how to go to multiple categories beyond the categories they were originally really good at. The collectibles and um, musical instruments was one of their like, initial great categories. And, um, and as they tried to be all things to all people, it became very hard for them to focus in on the niche and, and really address what the customer's needs were. So when we launched Reverb, it was really, it was so evident um, what the consumers were lacking, uh, pricing transparency being one of them, good customer service, um, a platform that engages people with content, relevant content, personalization, segmentation, all the, the buzzwords you hear. But when you plug all those things together and you build community, um, you really can build fans that are loyal. Um, they become great cohorts, and um, that your pro platform be can become very sticky. And then, Andy, maybe over to you. I think sure. that when I think of EBTH, I also think brand, and I also think a lot of technology has enabled you know really what you're able to do. Can you kind of speak to some of that? Yeah, sure. So everything but the house has taken a different approach to the secondhand or pre-owned commerce um, marketplace. So. You have eBay, let go, offer up at the bottom end of the secondhand um, kind of industry. And then you have Christie's, Sotheby's, Heritage Auctions, all at the highest end of that um, spectrum of, you know, call it item value. So you look at high end inventory, full service, you'd be the auctioneers. And then you have the pre owned peer to peer marketplaces on the lower end of that spectrum. We sit in this giant middle market between the full service auctioneer and the low service peer to peer commerce players. And the reason I bring that up is because you couldn't have built this business years ago in this space. So we provide a full service liquidation process for those going through a downsize, a death in the family, uh, or full service liquidation. Or if you have a single item or multi-item collection, we can actually perform the full service there. And so I bring that up because it takes a lot of technology, a lot of logistics, a lot of infrastructure for us to be able to absorb and inbound these items from the East Coast to the West Coast and transition a local, local to local commerce to a local to global. And so we've had to build the infrastructure, the technology to automate many of the processes that exist to take a single SKU item and convert it into a structured data item that has now a marketable image, good data, and allows us to actually transact that and ship that across the country. So thank you. Thank you just simply couldn't do that 10 years ago. Right, right. And then, and then Dana, from your perspective, from an investor perspective, you know, you've done a lot of, a lot of um, investments in marketplaces. What has been attracting you to them? And, you know, how do you feel that um, really that that, that is, has evolved and that there is a continued um, interest in those sectors? I like challenges. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, it, uh, you know, but seriously, I mean, I think marketplaces aren't for the, the faint of heart. I mean, it's, you, you know, it's like, I mean, these guys know much better than I do firsthand, but it is, it's that constant balancing of supply and demand. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to me, what we look for is having some source of proprietary or quasi-proprietary supply, um, you know, and, and that's, I mean, it's, it's really hard to do, but if you can do it, whether it's through a process like EBTH has done, 
by you know just really nailing the the entire process around an estate sale. And if you think about that, you know you think about what happens when you know a loved one passes away and you live in a different city. I mean the stress that there is for you know the family that's that's you know dealing with it. It's like you come in in that moment and really provide an incredible service. That's what the supply side is seeing. The buy side is is seeing incredible inventory that they're not seeing anywhere else. And so, you know, that's the the sort of the, the magic of getting a marketplace, right? And I think Reverb, I mean, is you know also has something really special uh, in in terms of having the this store in Chicago, which if anybody, I assume you guys still have, right. is amazing. I mean, it's like the Very coolest cool. place Very ever. Cool. If you're ever in Chicago and have any interest in music, you should go check it out. Um, because it's just this like mecca for musicians, and so you sort of have this like this this magic that you know becomes part of the brand, and I think it makes people want to you know be involved in that community. So you know we're always looking for something that's really special that that you know provides that proprietary supply. And then Peter, from your view, being you know private equity investor, um, and you think a lot about scale. Mm -hmm. So how is that kind of you know the evolution of of these types of business models? How, you know, how has that affected your view on them and your, your thought of investing in them? Sure. So I think at the highest level, I think we appreciate the benefits of the model if you can get it right. Obviously, you've got powerful network effects, and increasingly, marketplaces are becoming platforms almost as ecosystems where um, you're seeing the old power sellers from eBay become um, big players in modern-day marketplaces in the equivalent. So in the real real, there are brick-and-mortar um, consignment shops that are becoming some, becoming power sellers. Um, so rather than seeing their businesses get decimated by the real real, it seems, becomes a transformation of the business. Um, and so we see the prize, and we're attracted to the prize. But from our perspective as private equity, um, we're also, I'd say, maybe more sensitive to capital loss. And so we think about barriers. And to us, one of the greatest barriers is complexity. <laughs> and so. In some ways, it, it, it sounds counterintuitive because it's, um, it's, it's difficult to scale. But if you can nail it, it becomes a great competitive mode. And I think in each case of EBTH, Reverb, The Real Real, or Puppy Spot, um, a marketplace business that, that we own in the pet category, I, to anybody trying to get into that marketplace, I wish them good luck because it's really hard. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think we'd all agree. So. Well, given that, um, I think it would be interesting to talk a little bit about business models. You know, there's the consignment model, there's the buyout model, there's peer-to-peer, -peer, there's even some subscription-based models. Maybe I'll kind of kick it back to you, Andy. Maybe you can talk a little bit about your model, why it's been successful, and then we'll just go from there. Sure. So everything we sell is on consignment. So if you're looking to sell a full collection or a single item, um, you're basically consigning that item to EBTH. At that point in time, we sell it in a competitive auction-like environment on our platform at EBTH.com. Um, and then at the end of that conclusion of that process, we charge a, a take rate of approximately 35 to 40 percent. So because it's because it's full service, we can actually you know charge a much higher take rate um, and offset the unit you know produce healthy unit economics downstream. And so the interesting thing here though is because everything's on consignment now, it won't. I'm not sure it will always be like that. It is right now, and it's great. It's it's the wheelhouse where we live and and thrive. But over time, you know, talking about data and technology catching up is as our price prediction for this unique inventory and proprietary supply on the platform becomes more robust. Right now, we can predict value of the items selling on our platform at, with about 95 degree of certainty. And so over time, we foresee a future where with a, as a seller hits our platform, yes, you have the consignment auction and we'll run your, you know, the consignment opportunity will run your auction, but if you, you're the no risk seller, we may have a buyout option as well where we know that we can return, you know, buy the inventory for 60 cents on the dollar and then sell and actually make, you know, more of an economic um, equation work downstream. So yes, consignment model right now we're a big fan of. Over time, it could convert. And David, over over at Reverb, which you know I, I mentioned a brand for EBTH. I think Reverb is very much a brand, global, iconic in many ways. Um, you know, talk a little bit about and you know I, it was in your presentation earlier, and you kind of talked about the balance, and you kind of talked about the roadmap of of scaling the platform. Uh, his company is going to do over over half a, half a mil, or excuse me, almost half a billion of GMV this year. So. What has been the, 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 the balance and enabled you to really scale? You know, I, so I started the business um, in 2013. I had, um, after my last business, I said I wanted to do something totally different. I bought a guitar store, <laughs> spent a lot of money on it, and um, learned the hard way, um, retail and e-commerce. And I experienced the pain of, 
of selling on eBay. Um, so I launched a marketplace. And um, what I realized, though, was um, coming from the finance world, my last company was an online brokerage trading firm, uh, retail trading firm. I realized liquidity is everything. So when I launched Reverb, I realized that buyers and sellers, the spread between the bid ask spread between what a musician wants for their guitar and what that they want to pay for their next instrument was just too massive. And the only way I could deal with that was to have low fees and to inject liquidity into the market. Mm -hmm. So on Reverb, instead of getting 50 cents on the dollar when you're selling and paying 100 cents when you're buying, you're getting 70 cents and 75 cents. And I've now brought 220,000 unique entrepreneurs and sellers and flippers and dealers and all of them together fighting for price. I share the pricing and I make it global so that a guitar in Berlin, New York, and Tokyo are all priced the same, independent of shipping and VAT. And now all of a sudden you have velocity. So what people think is a niche business, we'll do around 650 million in GMV this year, I'm projecting to do around 2 billion in the next three years, is a function of instruments not sitting in closets and people not hoarding because availability is so there, right? Like an Uber's here, I don't need to go to Hertz. When you can buy and sell a guitar pedal or a record and you know what the price is gonna be and the price is gonna be the same tomorrow as in six months, all of a sudden your mind of how to buy and sell changes. You remove the risk. It's no longer, oh, I got it, now I'm gonna keep it. It's, I got it, I use it, I'm done using it, now someone else can use it. You see that with the real real. you see that with fashion, you see that with instruments, you see that with a lot of categories. I think that is the biggest opportunity for velocity and not so much focused on massive take rate, but focused on volume with reduced take rate to increase velocity. And that's, that's been our model, and that will continue to be our model. So, so Peter and Dana, um, really you see a lot of these different types of businesses, a lot of these different types of models. What are some of the ones you feel are more successful? Which ones do you think are more challenging? Um, can you speak to that a bit? Well, I mean, you know, look, anything uh, where you're actually having to touch the inventory is more challenging. I mean, <laughs> just by virtue of the logistics associated with it and, you know, shipping and, you know, all of the things that you have to have to do. But again, you know, as Peter said, I mean, it, that if you can really nail that and nail those processes and like refine, refine, refine so that you cut, you know, costs out of every part of the process. I mean, that's just a complete barrier to, to anybody else entering. And, and that's where I think scale is, is, is so critical in, in getting these businesses, um, you know, really to scale to, to build those barriers um, around, you know, processes and, and automating little parts of the process. Um, but, you know, all, and, and then, you know, also ultimately the data. And, you know, you mentioned with the real real. I mean, they um, c have come out with, uh, you know, sort of really interesting um, data and research around, uh, you know, the, the prices of, of, um, of, uh, of, you know, luxury goods. Sure. And, and it does change the way that people buy. Right. Uh, so you go in to buy, you know, an Hermes bag, and all of a sudden it's a diff you, you think about it differently because you're going to get, you know, potentially even the entire value back, uh, you know, in, in the resale. Absolutely. And Peter? Um, so I guess a, a couple of things. So, so first, I think on the question of model and is there a preference, I, clearly in addition to the complexity of, of having to touch inventory, there's also the capital requirements. And funding inventory through equity capital is never very attractive. Um, but by the same token, at scale, and if you've got insights through pricing, then and you have the capital and the balance sheet to do it, then that becomes another barrier to entry, um, which is which is an important consideration. Um, I think for for me, I, I'm agnostic on on revenue model, and more focused on does the model actually unlock new demand and grow the market? Are you bringing people into the category who weren't otherwise? participating. Um, so that ends up being, I think for us, one of the first considerations. It was one of the things that made us most excited about the real real. Um, just bringing new people who had never consigned before, making them consigners, who never bought online luxury on consignment. Um, that's extremely powerful. So I think this is a question to all of you, whoever wants to jump at it first. Um, really just kind of the idea of the adoption of re-commerce. You know, I think it was kind of taboo um, even a few years back, but you have millennials and you, like Dana said, you have all this data around luxury goods and some of the stuff, you know, uh, some of the stuff that David and, and Andy have on their site, it doesn't really depreciate almost, it has a 10 to 15 year lifetime or, or more. Um, some of it really appreciates. 
So can, can you speak a little bit, uh, maybe I'll just throw this out there to Andy because you're looking at me, but what do you <laughs> think about, about kind of the adoption of re-commerce? Don't look at Frank. Nope. Yeah, there you go. There you um, go. Yeah, I think the re-commerce thing is definitely, it's, it's a huge trend and it continues. You know, we see it every day that, and it amazes me, frankly speaking, that, you know, the things that people want to buy. And, you know, there is a buyer, there's a consumer for everything. And I think there is, <laughs> there's, you know, a trend right now that's, that's unique. It's the pri proprietary supply model. I think it's what excites Dana about this industry at large is the fact that, yeah, you're not, I'm not selling IKEA furniture, pottery barn, or restoration hardware. I'm selling stuff that was manufactured 20, 50, even 200 years ago. And that's, you know, that to me is, yes, there are trends that are consistent with that. And then you do see that as those values, you know, continue to grow through the platform. The other interesting thing that I love about this trend is, you know, because we have such a broad swath of inventory and categories on our platform, not a specific vertical, is that we can see, you know, the trend in the consumer behavior such that, you know, several years ago, Asian antiquities was hot and that market was hot and other, other subcategories weren't as hot. Well, now mid-century modern has kind of taken over and Asian antiquities have softened. And so we can kind of ride these times, but it's all based on that re-commerce trend that we're seeing at large. Yeah, and I you think that's, that? yeah, I think that's large. I mean, also a trend that's driven by the millennial buyer, mm -hmm. um, where they actually care um, care about waste and, and you know are much more thoughtful, I think, than you know those of us who are not millennials. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, and it's interesting. I mean, I think it's a. I mean, it's a very. I don't. It's not a fat. I mean, it's a very real trend, long term trend, and uh, and I think that you know that's going to play into you know every market. I do think it's also worth. Keeping in mind that, so used purchases have been around for a long time, and they've been large GMV, just not online historically. And whether that's used autos, used musical instruments, um, local consignment stores, and that going back to where the conversation started around what's activated the e-commerce component of it, I think it comes back to community and then trust. Mm -hmm. and. And, and, and whatever the trust markers are by vertical, I think people have just gotten a lot better at it. In some cases, it's just taken time. And then there is the overlay of millennial purchasing behavior, which I think is a clear accelerant. I think you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, David, I'll kick it to you, but I think you've built a trusted brand, right, between the buyers and the sellers. And you combine the trust with, um, with content. So, you know, I think while it has existed, the used market um, in my industry for many, many years, people have sought after use instruments, but what we're doing is we're educating people, we're giving them pricing data, so now all of a sudden, we're removing some of that uncertainty, and then combine that with a trust element where we'll take care of any problem that exists between buyer and seller, make it go away, then all of a sudden, used actually has a better value proposition than paying a premium for new. Um, the other element I'll add to that in my category, which I think applies to EBTH and others, is, um, Specifically with music, this sort of revenge of analog. So we started a record marketplace, and it's not 50-year-olds like me. I mean, it's 25-year-olds that are buying old Miles Davis records. And same thing with musical instruments. I think the next 10 years, you're going to see this backlash. While we're all going to be glued to our phones or whatever chips we embed in us, but there's going to be a love for old, like cool, vibey, analog, tactile experiences. And if you can box that in a marketplace, you're going to have the goods. That's, no, that's fantastic. So we started a little late, so maybe I'm going to steal an extra minute or two. But I, I want to, there's a couple questions I think that are really kind of interesting. One, I'm going to kick to you, Dana. It's really around KPIs and metrics, whether it's traffic, it's engagement, it's average order value. What are kind of the, the top things that you look at? Uh, all, all of the above, but, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, really the kind of the balance of the marketplace. Um, so, you know, again, making sure that you, you, you do have uh, the, the sort of balance of supply and demand. Um, and, you know, that, that ideally buyers are selling and, you know, and sellers are buying. And, and that, you know, does become kind of a virtual cycle and, and, and automatically, you know, dramatically decreases your customer acquisition cost. I mean, because, you know, at the end of the day, keeping people in, engaged in, in, you know, these platforms so that they will come back again and again and again and transact is the, the key to building a really healthy marketplace. Absolutely. And Peter, thinking about, because you think about exits all day long, right? So whenever you're thinking about valuation, mm -hmm. can you talk about things that you're thinking about, obviously scaling, you know, the technology there, that type of stuff? Can... Sure. I think it's one of the most difficult questions that we grapple with because typically where we're getting involved 
businesses are, they're, they're of scale, but they are not mature. And so if you've got a business that is, so first of all, I would amplify everything, I agree with everything Dana said. Um, and if you've got high repeating uh, businesses, there's a risk that you're going to value a business based on current economics and just roll out cohorts as they are. But in both David um, and, and Andy's businesses, I'm sure, the actual unit economics are changing and improving year by year, cohort by cohort. And so the, the, the math becomes, what do you think happens at each step of um, the, unit, the, the flow of unit economics? And we're typically underwriting um, our exits to some lofty but rational multiple of EBITDA. And it's really challenging when you're talking about businesses that are, again, scaled but nowhere near maturity. So it's, it's facts and circumstances, but I, we spend a lot of time on everything from literally product level margin to freight in to freight out to it, it, everything. It's a great question. And then the last question that we have time for, and this is uh, to, the, to the founders here, really just as you think about exit, you have a lot of options. Uh, marketplaces are you know, a very interesting sector right now, whether it's a strategic buyer like an eBay or, or someone like that, or whether it's a private equity exit, um, or even you know, working with a private equity group to maybe even roll up other properties. Um, you know, how do you think, and I'm not asking to say what is your actual plan, but whenever you think about these options, kind of what, what is interesting to you right now? I th I'm, I, I've done a couple businesses, so to me it's a fun factor. Like, if you're having fun and you're building a great team, like, Google shouldn't be in the email business. Why, why do we all use Gmail? Because <laughs> they fucking built Gmail <laughs> and it kicks ass. <laughs> like, I'm not, you know, as long as I'm having fun and building marketplaces, I've got a lot of ideas for other marketplaces. I'm sure Andy has ways to grow like this, ways to grow like this. When you build a good team and you're excited about what you do, you should keep doing it for as long as you can. Um, so that's how, I, that's how I approach my every day. Um, but I do have investors, and I have, I'm here to maximize shareholder value. Um, the best investments most of you have had are when your founders or your entrepreneur-backed companies go beyond your wildest expectations. So you gotta push them. You gotta, you gotta give them wide open spaces to like see beyond whatever that's in their current model or their current spreadsheet, and you've got to be able to dream. I was at the Zillow presentation, and, and Rich Barton is one of like my most admired um, entrepreneurs. That guy is like, when he launched Zillow, because I saw what he did with Expedia, I was in the travel business, and I, I sold my business when Rich launched Expedia. <laughs> and then when he launched Zillow, I'm like, watch. This is transforming everything. So you got to think big. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not thinking it. Fantastic answer. <laughs> OK. Andy, quickly. Yeah, I think, you know, is, I'd, you know, similar sentiment here to David, which is just continue to have fun, build a great brand, um, make sure you're building a sustainable business model. So keep an eye on the unit economics, especially at scale, because Peter's point is a good one. You know, if you're scaling the right way and deploying technology at the right way and the right, you know, form and function throughout the business, you should actually see, you know, improving margins at scale. And so as we look at our business, it's about execution, execution, execution. Don't get lost in who or how we're going to exit this business. Because if we do that, and we prove the economics at maturity, uh, those options will be there. And so yeah, I think they're the traditional players, an eBay or an Amazon, an Alibaba. Um, uh, Zillow you know, is an interesting thought, because we, we deal a lot in the you know, real estate side of things. So there are certainly the strategics that are out there. They're, they're PE opportunities. But right now, it's you know, the eye of the prize. You know, eye on the prize right now is all about execution yep. and becoming operationally <laughs> excellent. Fantastic. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have, but I want to thank the panel. You folks have been fantastic. Thank, thank you. Friends.